What is new with XMAP? You are all obviously somewhat adept, familiar with XMAP, but there is something new. There is the IntelliFent in the room. And then we're going to talk about some of the new applications and resources, probably some things that you haven't seen come out yet. Maybe if you're really on top of the game, what you have seen come out yet. But we're going to just get you familiar with what the most recent updates are. So first, the IntelliFlex RUO that came out this year. Looking at the history of XMAP systems before we talk about our newest baby. 1995, Luminex started. We had that Luminex 100 come out in 99. 2005, that got that upgrade to the 200. And then we hit the market in 2009 with the FlexMap 3D, which had been our flagship instrument for 11 years. We had 2010 with the MagPix that came out for a smaller segment. But now, 2021, that IntelliFlex has come out. It's the first instrument that we've got with those dual reporter capabilities with the side eject easier automation option. So looking at this versatile multiplexing platform that you're already familiar with that technology, but now we have these advanced features for an improved experience for what you're looking for. It's got that same multiplexing ca capacity at 500 beads, but an enhanced dynamic range. We're up at five and a half logs for that RP1 channel, for the PE channel that you're used to using with the legacy instruments. <clears throat> Excuse me. It can handle the 384 and 96 well plates, just like the FlexMap 3D can. This instrument, however, has the integrated PC and monitor in this machine. So what you see right here, that is all encompassing. There's no longer the need for the SDS on the side, like the LX200, or the PC and the monitor on the side, like the legacy instruments have. Everything is included in this platform. It has a read time that's similar to the flex map, thanks to the dual syringe capability. So we're looking at about 20 minutes for a 96 well plate under 75 minutes for a 384. The system is modular. We'll look at that in a little bit. So service time is going to be faster, quicker turnaround time, easier serviceability. So if the instrument goes down, it's going to be much quicker to get that thing back up again. It's also got fixed laser mounts. So what we're expecting to come out of that is that the lasers are going to handle that transit to you faster. So it's going to be faster to get that up and going once it gets installed into your laboratory. Anybody who's had any of our laser-based systems, you're hearing that and you're already going, mm, this is great. Laser stability is going to last a lot longer once it's dialed in. So far, we're seeing that that's the case. So very encouraging to hear that those fixed laser mounts as part of the design are starting to pan out. It's also got this, which you can't see terribly well, but a wide sliding access door. In fact, I'll just walk right across right here. This door slides so you have much easier access to the probe for the hands-on maintenance that y'all are used to doing for XMAP instruments. So it's a really well thought out and well designed instrument. We heard the input from our legacy instruments and took each of those pieces and really thoughtfully put that into the design of this instrument and how we can make it better for y'all. That's maybe part of what took that 11 years to get that design much better dialed in based on what we've been doing in the past. So that's just the IntelliFlex RUO. That's that top one, but you can see at the bottom that we have that side eject dual reporter feature as well. With that dual reporter instrument, you have a second purple laser that can enable that blue dye detection in addition. That does a four and a half log dynamic range capability. <clears throat> Excuse me and it has that side eject plate carrier. So that can seamlessly integrate into automation as compared with some of the adaptations that we've had to do with automating our instruments in the past. So you can see here the modularity that we've built into the guts of the machine. We've got an optics module, we've got a fluidics module, and we've got a plate module. So thinking about these modules as what's inside the instrument Something goes wrong in the optics module for some odd reason. We just pull that whole module out, swap in another module, troubleshooting's done, we call it a day. Serviceability is really increasing on this instrument and the engineers are going to be in and out a lot faster into your system. Just taking away the pressure from your laboratorians to coordinate with those engineers, dedicate a day to being there escorting them. So it's a, a much better, interaction with the machine, interaction with the service organization when you're dealing with this machine. 
Again, that reduced footprint you can see here that everything you see on this screen, everything you're having to deal with fitting onto your bench. Inside the guts again, we can see the two iterations of the lasers. So here on the left, that's the IntelliFlex RUO with the single reporter capabilities. We've got that red laser with via the APDs tells us what bead you're looking at. The green laser again with the one P RPT with the RP1PMT telling us what our reporter signal is coming off that bead. On the right side, you can see pretty much the same thing, detecting our bead in the same way detecting the PE signal in the same way, but we've now got that violet laser there at that angle, showing us any signal that comes from that additional blue dye as well. We have found with that new optics system that we've got in these machines, it's 11 years fresher than our most recent instrument, that we've got much better components that are giving us much better optical sensitivity in this machine. At the top, you can see with these rainbow beads, which are designed to land at specific MFIs, that we're not discriminating MFIs below 100, 150, 200 maybe. We're overlapping in our peaks for those beads that should be able to be discriminated at that stage. Whereas once we hit it with the IntelliFlex, we're discriminating down to the five MFI peak as compared to the 20 MFI peak. No overlap whatsoever. So what this is is space for more sensitive assays to be, de to be developed with real confidence. In this situation, you can see that you are going to reliably have a 20 MFI that you can reliably discriminate from an MFI of five and have confidence that those results are truly different. Looking here at single reporter detection on the uh, base model IntelliFlex, when you're looking to detect in this situation um, bound versus free drug, looking at both of them here captured on one bead, you can see that you can detect only your bound bead in well one and to detect, sorry, only your free bead in well one and to, de to detect your bound bead, you would need a separate well with an additional antibody for that. Both of those are using that PE channel with just the green laser. But use of that dual reporter feature with the dual reporter side eject model of the IntelliFlex, we now have the capability to detect both in one by using a blue dye in addition to the phycoerythrin. In that case, you have your two antibodies using the two different dyes at once mixed together in the same well at the same time on the same bead. We know that you're capturing both the free and bound with your capture reagent that's on the bead. Now you are finally able to detect both at once by using those two dyes at the same time. Now that's a great feature. You're essentially doubling the results that you're getting off that bead. Something we've never been able to deliver before that's really going to enrich your results, really going to drive your variability down because you're detecting it right there in that same well. <clears throat> Why did we choose violet? You can see here with where we were already with the red laser and the green laser that it makes good sense to spread across the spectrum and go for violet. So we went for that visible spectrum with no spectral overlap for where we were already with our existing lasers. There are intense reporter dyes available already. We'll hit those in a second. There are multiple dyes on the market. We've identified two or three that are looking like good candidates for that already, and we continue to do our work with the lovely Dr. Angeloni to find more and more good dyes for that. And we're not seeing any energy transfer between the reporter one and reporter two channels that we've chosen between the green and the purple lasers. So looking at the dual reporter inform, uh, looking at the dual reporter dyes that we've identified so far as good candidates, our front runners are Super Bright 436, which is available as a strip to have it in conjugate, as well as available pre conjugated to a good number of antibodies. And Brilliant Violet 421. Same situation, it's available both strip avidinized and con pre conjugated to a good number of antibodies. This seems to be the uh, dye of choice for Jackson 
labs who does most of their uh, secondary antibodies with brilliant violet as compared to super bright. But again, both can be found on a good number of antibodies out there. So looking at that good. Uh, not up here because it's such early data is star bright violet 440 from BioRed, starting to see some signs that that is up there with these two as exceptionally bright as compared to some of the other candidates that we've tried. You can see here, Lexa 405, Dialect 405, Horizon 450, not performing nearly as strongly as these two dyes are. Oh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't seeing any overlap channel to channel in true assays and that when we are running an assay with a single reporter as compared to a dual reporter function that we're not affecting any assay performance. It's what we've done here with a protein assay. We'll see that with a nucleic acid assay in the next slide as well. But what we've done here in chart A, we've run just our standard uh, serology assay. So this is a SARS-CoV-2 IgG assay that we've adapted a bit to also incorporate IgM detection. So we ran our kit as normal with the IgGPE single reporter detection. And then in B, we've swapped out that detection and done an IgM super bright as our detection antibody. You can see that we have low background signal in that case for the detection that we would expect and high signal for the IgM. And then when we do combine and run together, you can see that those curves essentially overlap. So we're not really getting any difference in performance performance when either runs as a single plex as compared when combined together. So that assay is performing just fine when run as a dual reporter assay, swap, adding in that IgM as compared to just swapping it in. Both run the same. And it looks just about the same, pretty much overlapping curves for a nucleic acid assay as well. To the left here, what we did was that same concept is single reporter at single, single plex as compared to dual plex just checking that they perform the same one way or the other, when it's in there, when it's not. And then on the other side, we looked at labeling on either the five prime or the three prime end. And again, did not matter where we applied that label. It didn't change any of the performance of the assay whatsoever. So applications that we're really excited about seeing with this dual reporter functionality on this machine going forward, Phosphorylation versus total, that's a big one. And they're not in order here going around, but total and phosphorylation, protein-protein interactions are something we're interested in seeing going forward on these beads. Isotyping, which we've already done some feasibility proof of concept on for IgG, IgM. Class switching would be a nice thing to see done on these beads. Neutralization assays, Steve will be speaking a bit to that later free versus bound drugs. That's an easy example that we've popped up on the screen for you already. Looking at bispecific antibodies, fusion proteins. So as you think about this more and more, I hope those creative juices start flowing. And you think about you know, situations you've been in where you want to detect multiple things you've had to do wells in parallel. That just creates so many opportunities for mistakes, for variability. And that's what we're really looking to help you improve your assay results by putting that into one well, finally, getting away from that side-by-side -side situation. Now we get to move on to some fresh applications and resources that are have been updated or that are about to be updated. First, our Luminex learning classes. So those in the last couple of years have been pivoted a bit to virtual. We are looking forward to 2022 when we'll be able to invite people back into Austin to our classes again. Um, so we've got a course list of a lot of XMAP focused classes, and of course we've added IntelliFlex classes to that in this past year as well. 2022, those are going to be offered in the same format. There's the XMAP, uh, I'm sorry, there's the IntelliFlex end user, IntelliFlex advanced, in, and the development classes and all of our legacy instruments as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our kit finder has been updated, and again, our partners are regularly updating that with information on their kits. As they are working on their kits and compatibility with the IntelliFlex, that information is going to be available as well. So you'll be able to find fresh, rich information in that kit finder, and there's an initiative to keep that kit finder much more updated in the coming years. So check the kit finder out if you've worked with it in the past and maybe had some trouble. 
you should have a much better experience now. Our cookbook version five should be coming soon, probably late this year, or early next year is our goal. And we've already got some technical notes out, specifically looking at the dual reporter functionality on the IntelliFlex that you can access today that also are going to be available in the cookbook when that becomes a version five next year. Our research publications database is up above 54,000 publications at this point. If you're not familiar with that, we scrape many of the major publications databases for Luminex specific keywords, dump them all into here so you can search that for a more curated list of Luminex relevant publications. Helps get away from all of that extra fluff if you're looking for something that may apply to Luminex. And then you can pull down those abstracts, you can link back to that specific publication if you're interested in it. So good place to always get started if you're ideating a new project. And then we've had a good number of publications that have come out recently. There is a Jove article about dual reporter neutralization that I won't steal Steve's thunder on because I think that he'll be speaking to that a good amount. Uh, we've also had a publication come out looking at our multi-antigen IgG assay for SARS-CoV-2 serology on dried blood spots. That came out of, I believe, the Mayo Clinic. Very worth looking at the, the different um, sample type and how they applied that onto our our kit. We have a um, tech note that came out on using our assay and transforming that into an isotyping expansion. So expanding that to IgM and IgA applications. It is not applied to the dual reporter functionality of the IntelliFlex, but it's a very easy half step forward from that white paper to do that as well. So if that's not um, obvious and intuitive from that paper, something our application scientists would be happy to help you with. And Jackie will be speaking to them and how to get in touch with them through the Explore Lab a little bit later today. We also launched the Sheath and Dry Fluid Plus, which is something that is the only functioning sheath fluid for the um, IntelliFlex. So that is something all of our instruments will be moving forward with. Just a little review of that sheath fluid and its antimicrobial functionality, why we've gone to that as a sheath fluid of choice for our instruments. And then a couple of extra slightly different direction white papers that we've got out, one reviewing the contributions of XMAP to the HPV vaccine development over time, looking at how we've really contributed to the advancement of the Gardasil vaccine and how XMAP played a role in some biologic immunogenicity assessments over time. So with that, I have wrapped up. Thank you for sitting through my update on what's fresh with XMAP. Any questions? Thank you, Heather. Questions?